The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. We'll begin the presentation shortly. We're still waiting for attendees to join in. Please be patient. Welcome everyone. We're going to begin in, in just a few minutes. We're still waiting for attendees to join uh, to arrive, so we'll be starting shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be getting in just a few moments. Uh, we're still waiting for some attendees to arrive. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Leveraging VR for AEC. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer's default audio device. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will be closing the webinar at the top of the hour to respect everyone's workday. If there are any outstanding questions that don't get uh, spoken to or, or answered, we'll be following up with you um, afterwards. Welcome to Leveraging Virtual Reality for Projects in the AEC Industry, sponsored by Walter P. Moore Technology. In addition to offering virtual reality services, we also provide IT managed services and consulting, custom software development, cybersecurity risk assessment, and BIM project coordination services. Our contact information is shown on the slide. Please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like more information after today's event. Today's presenter is Karis Frazier Baker. Karis is a team member in our virtual reality studio and is the team lead technical artist for the studio. She creates, polishes, and maintains usability, beauty, and comfort of the user experience in virtual reality interoperative applications using our innovative VR toolset. She specializes in virtual reality application development, including programming, animation, and modeling. 
She will discuss how our firm responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and maintained communication and collaboration in the work from home environment using VR as a tool for design review and coordination. I would now like to introduce Karis Frazier Baker, technical artist for Walter P. Moore. Karis, you now have the floor. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you guys so much for being here today. It is so exciting to tell you guys all about the work that we've been doing in the virtual reality studios. So my name is Karis, and uh, later on we'll be joined by Brian Stabile, our software engineer, to answer our questions. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I would be happy to share with you um, some of the work that we've done here. And uh, one of the biggest things that I want to communicate to you is that the uh, the engineering world, there, there's kind of a, an elephant in the room. So a lot of us that are joining us here today are gaming professionals. A lot of them are, you know, maybe real-time professionals in other industries. Um, some of us are AEC professionals, and maybe we have technology enthusiasts as well. So I want to kind of uh, illustrate for you a divide that I've experienced being a part of both industries uh, for the past three years or so. Um, the... AEC and uh, professionals, they live in this world where they have to render everything that they look at. So let's say that they're building a building and they want to be able to see what it's going to look like. They have to be able to render it and, and it's burning valuable work time to render each individual pixel. Um, and in the gaming professional world, we uh, just kind of experience real time uh, on a regular basis. So what does real time mean? That means that everything is re rendered on every tick. So you are never waiting for those images to render. You're seeing them immediately. Um, so when we bring real time to the AEC industry, it is immediately valuable just by allowing the engineer to not have to wait to be able to see something. So when we take it a step further and we bring it into the virtual reality spectrum, um, you are allowing the engineer not only immediate visualization, but also uh, the, the concept of putting them in place uh, in a space that doesn't exist yet that they just designed. So in a, in a space where the entire experience is relative to like being physically there, everything's on one-to-one -one scale, real world scale, you're looking physically up at a skyscraper that you're working on, you can understand why we're using virtual reality as a tool. So I wanna also cover some of the uh, terminology that we might be using. 3DOF and 6DOF. Uh, 3DOF you might be familiar with if you've tried it before, and I always recommend to give it a shot, but I wanna make a, a, a line of delineation here between 3DOF and 6DOF because you may have used a 360 spherical photo or a, a Google Cardboard experience. Um, and that's going to be significantly different than what we're going to be discussing today uh, with Sixdoff. Uh, so stationary rotation, uh, putting in your head in one spot and being able to look around, it's going to be great. Uh, but we're going to be describing Sixdoff, which is not only translation, sorry, not only rotation, but also translation in the virtual world. So, um, so that allows us to not only wrap our heads around the project, but also translate and rotate um, as if you were physically there in the space. So imagine being able to visit a building before ground is even broken. Uh, it's just immediate, it just makes sense, right? So we also, to, to bring it beyond the pre-visualization aspect, we incorporate simulation data from our engineers in VR so that they're able to uh, corroborate the data that they've found and be able to communicate that data so communication is a big part of it as well. We've often seen long email chains and uh, debates get nipped in the bud um, immediately when everyone's on the same page and they see that in virtual reality, like, you know what, this is a good idea, or I do like this, or you know what, you were right about this, or I can see where you're coming from. It happens all the time, and it's just one of the beauties of, of what I do. Um, so like we talked about with the, you know, describing the rendering versus real-time thing, one of the major things that virtual reality brings to the table for us in the AEC industry is quick and easy navigation. Um, we've been able to de design some very simple and uh, easy to navigate tools uh, for the engineering professionals that allows them to just fly around as if they are superheroes in a space um, while using some skeuomorphic, familiar 
uh, imagery for, for the construction and engineering industry. Um, and in particular, at our studio, we provide custom experiences. So let's say you have a particular issue and you want a particular solution, you would have the gaming professionals that are able to design that and develop it for you and uh, deliver it in a reasonable amount of time. So that's uh, it's kind of exciting. So I want to take a look at some unique perspectives. Why would these individuals be interested in a product like this? I want to tell you about an experience I had at uh, Chicago ACEC, which is the American Council of Engineering Companies, uh, in 2019. And we were uh, positioned at a booth next to an individual who was listening the whole time to our spiel. We were talking about, hey, give us your Revit files and we'll be able to give you a virtual reality build with all of our custom tools in less than an hour, uh, depending on the size of the project. <laughs> and uh, they, they were listening and they had this project they've been working on. They were building their own home. And they, they said, you know, I've been listening to you. Is it true? Can I give you my Revit file? And can you give me a virtual reality build? And can I try it? So, of course, we said yes. And in the end, we had that person inside of VR looking at their own home. And for the first time, they had been building it for three years. Next week, they were going to be pay, uh, signing the paperwork. And next month, they were going to be getting, be beginning construction on it. Um, and I remember this person being in VR for an hour or more, and they were going around and looking, going, this is my wife's soaking tub. This is my daughter's bedroom. This is my back porch. And they were very emotional. Uh, and when they lifted up the headset, they looked at us and they said, where were you six months ago? Where were you a year ago? If I had this tool available to me, I would have made so many changes. So this guy, he got it. We've got the creative director. So let's say this person is has creative control over a project, but doesn't necessarily have their hands in the clay, so to speak. Um, but they need to be able to make a, a, they need to be able to approve the design, right? So let's say that this person has uh, kind of put a stopgap to one of the developments that we're doing because they're unhappy with one of the ways that we're working on something. We uh, bring them into the office and they're looking at it on the computer screen and no, 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 it's just not right. We have to redo it. I don't like that. I'm like, well, let's, let's take a look at it in VR. So they oblige, they jump into VR and they're looking around and they're using the walk tool as if they're uh, actually in the space and they're, they're peering around and experiencing a one-to-one -one scale. And they go, you know what, you know what, this is really good. And you know what, I'd like to do more. So not only did we not have to redo the project, but it also turned into more work in a positive way for us as a firm. Here's our advanced user, the project manager. Now this person is going to be using both controllers, the way that we've designed the product. Uh, both controllers have the same capabilities and you're able to load one tool on one and one tool on another. And maybe that's a locomotion tool on one and a markup tool on another. And they're able to fly around and mark up in 3D space as if they're just living in it. Like it's pretty unique to see. So they're spending an hour or more doing their markup as they would in Bluebeam, but they're doing it and it feels natural. And they're coming out with a PDF that they've exported from their experience um, that they're able to send over to whomever they need to, whether it's the, uh, the vendors that they're coordinating with or the engineers that they have underneath them. And um, making valuable changes, making valuable comments, deciding which beams to move, deciding which uh, who, who should handle the clash that's occurring in the, in the wall with the pipe. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a consistent part of our workflow here at Walter P. Moore, and it's something that we've really come to appreciate as um, just a, a part of the way that we do things. Um, in fact, some of our larger clients will ask for a virtual reality build with every you know, design review and uh, project delivery um, because they have the VR theater in their office. So we just toss it over to them and they look at it. All the, the notes that are being taken by the project manager are saved and then loaded into theirs so they can jump exactly to where they were when they made those, those, uh, those notes. So as you can see, these are three different unique perspectives of the same tool that we're able to use in uh, very different ways, but always providing value saving time, saving money, and preventing errors.
And uh, we've been using VR since 2017. Uh, all the way back then, you know, our project manager, Scott, he started the Vault of Timor VR studio just by saying, you know what, I bet we could do this. And it turns out we can. And it does provide a, a ton of value. And so I'll, one of the things I want to share with you today, not only showing you some of the projects that we've done, but also explaining how you might be able to incorporate this into your firm. Um, so uh, we, we are a big proponent of VR as the future of technology, the future of technology in engineering in particular. And uh, we want to we want to perpetuate that. So one of the ways that we've accomplished that is by uh, installing VR theaters in a number of our uh, offices. Walter P. Moore has offices globally. So we have uh, the red dots representing the virtual reality theaters. And what that, might mean, uh, what that means is we have an HTC Vive, HTC Vive Pro, or an HTC uh, Cosmos Elite uh, in, any, in these uh, locations where the engineers can go into the room and they can have that set up prepared for them. So uh, uh, some of the projects that we've worked on using virtual reality uh, are going to be ex uh, shown here. First one we have for you is the Rogers Center. Now this is a stadium in Toronto, Canada, and one of our calling cards as Walter uh, as Walter P. Moore is the retractable roof. You know, back in the day, we did design the Astro Dome, um, so we are regularly asked to design retractable stadium roofs. Uh, in this particular project, uh, we were asked to corroborate some, some simulation data. That simulation data was for the daylighting glare probability, or DGP. And that meant that the design that we were doing, um, that we had a few different options. Some of them had holes to provide more natural light. And by holes, I mean like windows, right? Um, and we wanted to make sure that the pitcher, the catcher, the outfielders would never have, you know, intolerable glare in their eyes at any given moment. So uh, the simulations were run, and then we used the virtual reality build. We set it to its geo uh, uh, GPS accurate coordinates, and then we used the sun tool that we designed to show where the sun would be at any given day, hour, and determined that the instances where the simulation showed that there was intolerable glare, the sun was actually peering through those options, uh, the, the holes in the roof. And from that, we, the team was able to make valuable decisions about which design they wanted to go with. This one's near and dear to my heart. Uh, so if any of you are from Orlando, you might recognize this one. This is the Church Street Plaza that was recently erected. Now this virtual reality build, of course, was built before uh, the building was completed. So everything you're looking at is from our virtual reality build. So this one was unique in the way that we uh, were asked to build it to show any issues there may be with visibility of signage after the building was erected. Now, there hadn't been any new construction, specifically new skyscrapers in downtown Orlando since the 2008 housing crisis. So this one was a, was a, a, a really unique opportunity um, and also, it's down the street from, from the Walter P. Moore office. Uh, as you can see, the Bank of America building is just down the street from it. Um, so we actually bought drone scan data from a third-party company. So the surrounding area of Orlando that you see there is geometry that was recorded from a drone fly-through. And then we were able to outfit it with offices on the interior. And then we actually showed it and, and displayed it. Uh, to the client's groundbreaking ceremony um, for, for all the people who attended. And some of the jokes that were made were, wow, I could, I could choose which floor I want to purchase my office on based off of the, the view that's going to be out the window. It was pretty, pretty exciting. This project is the proposed Tampa Bay Rays Stadium. And this project in particular is unique because we were able to... Uh, fit the need of the engineer that had requested it because uh, even though they didn't have any virtual reality software, or sorry, hardware, uh, they actually used their cell phone and a 360 photo viewer. Um, we took 360 photos within the VR uh, environment and then we delivered those 360 photos to the engineer. The engineer put the 360 photo 
into the viewer and their cell phone, and then they were able to show that to the client quickly and easily with their cell phone. And they were able to make decisions between ETFE and PTFE covering for the stadia roof. Um, in this Im image, we have put into VR the ball flight lines that were used in the development of the roof. They wanted to make sure that the stadium roof had the lowest possible profile, so they actually incorporated the previous season's highest and longest uh, uh, baseball flight paths to make sure that they weren't going to be impacting gameplay when they, when they built the lowest possible profile for that, that roof. This one is the UCF downtown campus currently under construction. Um, this project is unique because it is purely what was out of our build server. Now we're going to talk about our build server in just a little bit. Um, everything previous was doctored up a little bit in Unity by uh, a technical artist. And in this case, this is purely what was delivered out of the build server, which is something else that we work on here in the studio. So this project um, is, as you can imagine, the UCF downtown campus, as well as some um, student housing there in the back. Uh, we also incorporated this relative to the downtown area so that we can understand uh, where the, the skyline of Orlando would be visible, incorporating the Tremont Tower as well, or the uh, Church Street Plaza as well. This one is the Sunset Spectacular. Now, the Sunset Spectacular is a billboard on Sunset Boulevard, I believe. And uh, this one was brought to me and the, the, the problem that was proposed was that the architect that they were working with, they had a meeting the next day. So it was a pretty fast turnaround. And one of the concerns was the paneling on one side of the billboard needed to be a little bit thicker for to, to meet some structural needs. And the architect was concerned that the change in the paneling would compromise the integrity of the design. So what we did is we incorporated this um, virtual reality build in their meeting. And on the layer menu, we put the, uh, the first thickness of the paneling and the second thickness of the paneling. And we turned them on and off and showed that the change in the paneling thickness would not make any visible difference, uh, at least from the road and the architect agreed and they were able to move on with the project with the newly proposed paneling thickness. So as you can see, virtual reality really can go beyond just the wow factor because, you know, pre-visualization pre has been a big part of architecture and engineering for quite a while. And just putting the geometry in VR and putting the headset on is immediately valuable. Um, and you get that wow moment, but we really want to take it so much further. And I believe that we have. So I want to illustrate for you a little bit of how we did that. So back in 2017, where we're going to consider that era, the Mark I of our tool set, um, right around the time that we, I believe it was 2019 or so, we did a brand refresh for Walter P. Moore. Um, so we Describe that as Mark II, where we did a whole brand refresh. And we took our Mark I and we added a new coat of paint, made it really fresh. And while Mark II was in development, we began our work on Mark III. And Mark III was proposed for all the entirety of 2020. And as we know, that got interrupted by a few things. So uh, while we were responding to the work from home needs, uh, we decided to maintain our work on Mark III and add the support for uh, a desktop version that we were already we already had available in Mark II and Mark I, but we really made it work for uh, for the needs of our engineers who were working at home, who didn't have any VR hardware, who didn't have access to the VR theaters, who maybe didn't want to go into the office to use the VR theaters right? Or maybe they live too far away. A lot of different issues that occurred and we wanted to make sure that we were incorporating everybody's needs so that everyone can continue working and, and keep our excellent progress that we had been having before this pandemic, right? So we did that in a number of ways. We, um, we brushed up our, our drone capabilities, which is the desktop version of our VR. It's really difficult to say desktop capable virtual reality with no virtual reality headset. So what it really turned into was a 
video game that they were able to pilot with the WSAD keys um, and uh, do the markup and everything else with the mouse. So um, that, that was how we accomplished that and still maintained our work on Mark III. So um, this is our team here in the Walter P. Moore studio. So we've got our project manager, our software engineer, you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, and uh, we were able to create this, this is all about Mark III in particular. The spherical menu was, was kind of the idea to bring everything into the forefront. Um, some of the, responding to some of the feedback that we had received from the engineers that the menu was a little bit difficult to uh, maneuver because of the amount of input it took to get to each individual tool. We wanted to cut that input by half and uh, really make a focus on our tool set. So we simplified our tool set and we, uh, we made this just the most uh, seamless as possible user experience we could. Um, so I wanna highlight just really quickly the tools that we ended up on. Our locomotion tools, the lift, the, our portals menu, the walk, tools menu, capture, highlight, measure, settings, visual style, layers, and sun tool. Um, so this is what our menu ended up looking like using an equi rectangular grid to plan everything out, making sure that it is within our maximum view. And uh, this is how it ended up looking in Unity. Uh, look out for a marketing video shortly uh, after this week that we'll be able to, to highlight everything. I'll make sure I put it on my LinkedIn. Um, we use an HTC Vive, HTC Vive Pro, and the HTC Cosmos Elite for all of our all of our uh, our theaters and all of our at home theaters. We utilize Steam VR, and uh, we also have our build server. Right. So at the current moment, we have a Revit plugin that allows our engineers to get one button press, uh, and that will start a Rube Goldberg machine of processes that gets you to the end result of a email that contains an executable with the tessellated, optimized, textured uh, geometry with all of our tool set stock features incorporated, ready for you to play in VR. Uh, now that process used to take about one month of man time. And now with our automated process, that can take at least an hour, depending on the size of the project. Um, so a little bit about the VR build. If this is something that you want to do for your firm, if this is something that you're interested in, um, and what, what is it that we mean when we say VR build? That is an application, uh, like I said, that contains the geometry and is for use in virtual reality. And in brass tacks, it's a zipped folder that contains an executable. And an executable is a file that runs an application. Um, here is an example of what you might see inside of Revit. Revit is an Autodesk product that our engineers use basically to create 3D blueprints for different projects. Um, so it's uh, pretty standard for us. And for my 3D modeling and sculpting professionals, uh, my gaming professionals, um, we use uh, you know, non-uniform um, uh, NURBS. We use NURBS. And uh, whenever we're taught in school, right, um, my, my computer animation background says that NURBS are not something you typically want to model in because they can't be rendered. That's where um, this entire process comes in, where we need to be able to render those NURBS. So we start in the design software, which is Revit, Autodesk Revit in this case. Um, the, auto, uh, the automated process takes the, that geometry and it tosses it into another uh, third-party software that can then uh, tessellate or uh, create geometry or, you know, turn it into um, a, a tr uh, translate it from NURBS into geometry in the process called tessellation. Um, and then it takes that and it tosses it into the game engine and the game engine it applies, and we use Unity 3D, uh, it applies the tool set and all the things that make it able to run in VR. Unity then kicks it off into uh, a executable, and then we package that executable up into the email and send it back to the person that uh, requested the plugin in the first place. Um, this entire process, we're retaining BIM data, we're retaining material data, and we're keeping all those things uh, along for the ride to get to the final resting place, which is that, that final email. 
So there's that. Um, I want to take a moment to talk to you guys about what, what does the future hold for the for this, right? Um, back in November 2019, we did a exploratory augmented reality project. And one of the things that we determined was that the uh, hardware just wasn't quite there. And it's been a few years since then. And I think it was yesterday or two days ago that uh, Qualcomm announced this uh, reference blueprint for um, the future that may be seen in 2022. Um, it's being looked at by Samsung and other uh, companies to create something similar. And this is similar to what you may have seen in Magic Leap uh, in real. Uh, it is a tethered, uh, it is a fashionable wearable augmented reality viewer with a, a USB-C tether to a uh, Android phone with a Snapdragon Qualcomm chip or higher. And um, the, the initial and most viable use case for this, it's being said, is going to be um, second and third monitors for your work from home station. Um, so I think that is a very viable use case for this kind of technology and it will push it for, uh, forward. Um, but what that means is it's going to become ubiquitous just the same way our iPhones have, our iPads, our, our, you know, our Windows devices, and et cetera. So fashionable wearables will become the part of our lives. It's, 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 what I'm, it's my opinion, which I think is going to bring it into the construction site where we're going to be able to see the as-built compared to the design intent, right? We're going to see the construction site just the way it is, and we'll be able to put on our little classes and see the way that we have designed the system. Now, hopefully this incorporates some problems, and I know a lot of these problems, we don't have to talk about them today, but um, uh, hopefully in 2022 and further, we'll be able to solve some of those issues, a lot of them being human issues, a lot of them being uh, accuracy issues with the, you know, the all the different um, accelerometers and things that have to, to run inside of those objects or the hardware. Um, and uh, I, it's only going to become better. Uh, I don't see this technology as going away anytime soon. It is an exponential technology, has already met its peak and its fall and finally found a com comfortable place. And um, I think that augmented reality and virtual reality are going to join into one device with an opacity setting at some point in the future. And that's just my opinion. Um, but I want to thank you guys for your time and your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please, uh, like, uh, like they said before, put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Stabile. Brian Stabile is a software engineer, as you guys saw, um, my esteemed colleague. And uh, Brian, do we have any questions? Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I've got a, we got a few questions. If you got any more? Um, please just use the QA. It's a little actually it's called the questions window. Uh, I'm just going to go through them one by one, answer them as best as I can. So we've got two actually from Tim that are that are kind of related. It says. Have you been able to use the Cosmos MRXR faceplate for any applications? And also, are you doing AR HMD style apps that would benefit from that type of XR? At the moment, we are not doing anything like that. Um, in our opinions, uh, AR, at the moment, we have issues with um, fidelity as far as uh, drift, right? So if we try and do something on an actual work site, we have to have the trackers, and there's, there's always a little bit of precision error. And so when you're off by a little bit, when you have like a, an angled surface, it goes from being a little bit off to a whole lot off. Um, so when we have very large structures, it's very difficult to do that. But that is the goal down the line for this industry is eventually you'll be able to look at your site, you put on your glasses and you see the actual uh, virtual version of your uh, structure. Uh, okay, um, but we do wanna do it. And then another <laughs> one from Farah is, in this process, are you rendering throughout the design or is it instances? I'm kind of confused by this question. If you want to clarify that a little bit more. Are you saying that, um, are we adding, uh, are we doing different renders at different points in the design review process or is it just at one point? Um, because 
it kind of goes both ways, um, depending on the project. Sometimes we are giving them multiple iterations and giving them updates, and sometimes they only need, need one. So for instance, if it's like a client project, they're only going to need one, and uh, we'll give them one at the end of the project. Or if it's something with a project manager, uh, we'll give them updates every design review so that they can continue to do their work. So that would be, um, we receive new models, we give them new uh, builds, or they request new mo models, and they receive new emails from the build server, depending on which way they want to go. Okay, are there any other questions? If you would like to not use the questions bar, if you want to speak, feel free. So Brian, I got a couple that's coming individually here. What is the sure. typical cost of a VR room equipment? Okay, um, for our setup, right, what we're spec to use is we use the VR or we use the, VR, we use the Vive uh, Pro or Vive Cosmos Pro or the typical Vive headset. And that's around right now. I know the the original one is 600. What's the Cosmos Pro? It's about 1,000. It's about 1,500. Okay. Uh, with all the, the bells and whistles and especially if you don't have a computer that can run it, you have to make sure that your computer can run it and that you have the most updated hardware to be able to have the input that it's, is necessary. And if that's something that you're interested in, um, feel free to reach us, reach out to us and we can help you get outfitted. It is a lot lower spec than people assume though. It's basically a gaming PC and a headset. This yeah. essentially will get you ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the fun fun things like the, the elements that keep your, uh, sorry, the wireless, right? You can um, upgrade to the, a wireless headset. Um, and if you need a, a wireless laptop, there can be an, a, an external chassis, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of fun things that we can do depending on your actual needs. So uh, let us know if you need any help with that. Yep. Thank we you. can even take an external uh, graphics card, like a chassis to house a graphics card just mm -hmm. to give you a better frame rate. Because that is a problem, right, with VR is you want to make sure you always have a good frame rate because you're going to get sick. Yeah. So previously, Karis, you had mentioned um, what was needed to make the VR build, but you had mentioned Revit. Can you talk about any other platforms that would be used as well? Yes. So we can actually incorporate any platform at all. We spoke specifically about Revit because it's what we have the plugin in. But we can take uh, data from Navisworks, SketchUp, uh, we can take plain old OBJs, FBXs, um, and Tecla. Um, anything that, that has geometry, we likely can get it to a, a file type that we can end up putting in virtual reality. Excellent. There's someone here that I got in um, that kind of goes back to what Brian was talking about. Is it difficult to use the VR tool set? Uh, do different people react differently uh, to being in the immersive environment? I'll, I'll take this one. So, um, <laughs> yes, and it's a lot of fun. And I, I think that it's a lot of fun for us to incorporate everybody's unique experiences to make everybody's experiences as seamless as possible. Uh, but there's always going to be the, the first time user and they, they kind of experience a moment of panic where they put it on and they hold the controllers and they just sit there and they, they feel like they can't move. Because uh, they they don't they're not really sure what's going on they're a little scared they get like a shell shock moment and so we're they're sitting there and we're saying like okay move your pointer finger and they start moving their thumb so they they completely forget where they exist like they they don't know what they have for breakfast everything's gone um, so in those scenarios we will only give them one controller and we make sure to uh, b before the headset goes on give them a complete uh, tutorial without like with, while they're able to still look at, sorry, I'll just do this. Um, while they're still able to look at it, right? And like, this is the trackpad, this is the menu button and clearly explain the terminology so that once they're in the headset, they can have that conversation with us. They know what the trigger is. Um, they know how to use the, the, the trackpad, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have the, 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 the seasoned veterans of gaming where they get in there and they are good. They, everything's intuitive and they just fly around as if they've been in there their whole lives. 
So the, it, there's, it's, there's definitely a spectrum. And like we described with the, the client and the others, uh, we try to incorporate everybody's unique experiences and um, make it as comfortable as possible. And just to answer your question directly, that is our main focus is making it as comfortable as possible because we know that this tool set is being used by a wide audience. I find that um, adding haptic feedback to button presses, mousing, mouse over conditions, things like that, that really integrates it into people who aren't used to being in a VR environment. So they actually, if you don't know what I'm talking about, haptic feedback, the controller it will shake when their pointer goes over it's something that they can interact with, something they can push, anything that's providing a change in the state. So um, it allows them to uh, recognize what's happening. Because uh, mainly uh, our issue is people who, you know, I come from a gaming background, so does Karis. We just assume everybody knows WASDA mouse key or not WASDA and mouse and then, you know, what UI elements are and things like that. But some people in here have never used uh, those type of tools. And so the tricks that we use for gamers, we have to also uh, expand them for people who are very inexperienced with that type of software. Excellent. The next one we have for you guys is, how long did it take you from start to finish to create, implement your Mark One, Mark Two, and Three setups? Paris, uh, Mark One. I wasn't was, there for, for Mark One and Two. I, I, uh, I helped only. So Mark One was from 2017 to 2018. Um, uh, I joined the firm in June 2018, and we continued Mark One until June, July 2019. So Mark twenty uh, Mark one was from uh, twenty seventeen to twenty nineteen. Mark two was a few months. We only uh, just threw a coat of paint on it. We updated all of the like as you can see this this new brand identity with the, the triangles and everything, the new color palette. We updated everything very quickly. And while we were doing that, uh, we were utilizing Mark two uh, with uh, delivering to the engineers while we were developing Mark three. So Mark three took uh, about a year. And at the moment, um, as you can imagine with everything that's going on, we've added networking, we've added the uh, additional drone and desktop support to the Mark III design. And as it was originally designed, Mark III is completed. So we're kind of in a like a, like a um, Mark III.2 kind of situation, but it gets confusing, right? Um, and so Mark II was only a few months and Mark III was a year. Mm -hmm. The biggest shift was we had to swap out um, our whole graphics pipeline because mm -hmm. we can now use Unity rolled out the universal render pipeline, yes. which gave us a lot more graphical fidelity while not sacrificing frame rate that much. Uh, and so uh, it looks a whole lot better, especially the, the lighting and, um, and also future proofing. Our, our input controllers, we switched from VRTK over to MRTK because that VRTK, they've stopped support of that, which was uh, surprising and unfortunate. So we had to find MRTK, which is a fork of that that uh, library, but one that is going to be supported for a couple of years down the line. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, one more here, it's kind of in line with the previous question. Mm -hmm. What are some of the issues that you've been unable to solve when developing the system, i.e. what uh, did you need to give up on technology-wise, if anything? At the moment, That's audio is one thing because uh, the built-in uh, speakers that come with these headsets are not very good, and a lot of people end up removing them. Um, and then if you want to have a sound, you have to put on your own uh, headset or your own um, earphones, which can be a bit much. So I was going to rely a lot on positional audio to help track things, but it's going to have to be like a optional thing that's kind of on the back burner because most people aren't using it with audio. I, I would say um, baked lighting. Uh, I, I wanted to incorporate more baked lighting into the, the builds, but because we consistently rely on dynamic lighting with our sun tool in order to change the position of the light, um, can't bake lights when your lights are dynamic. So uh, I, I consistently like went up against that, like, oh, I want to add this. We have to use dynamic lighting. Oh, I want to add this, but can't. Um, so uh, I think moving on in the future, I would like to incorporate kind of a toggle for a baked lighting setting. And then when you jump in the sun tool, you activate the dynamic light, and then you're then able to change it with a different scenario at all, entirely. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for the feedback. Um, one more here for you. Uh, how much of a process was it 
to create your build process, taking a process that was used to take a month or more and smoothing it out to an hour or more, depending on the project, is quite an accomplishment. How long did it take? So uh, yeah. that was begun yeah. by uh, Scott Gothier and the team that previously was in the VR studio. And um, we continued to work on it well into, uh, we're continuing to polish it even now. We have to constantly update it. We have to keep it up to snuff. Um, so I, I would say that it's never complete. Um, we're always updating it. I think that is like, I think we got to where we are to be able to say that we, it's working right. Probably in a year or two. And then, um, we're always improving it, always seeking out new ways, always reaching and researching, uh, ways that we can enhance our, our process. Excellent. And, um, we're getting to the tail end of our questions here. So if anybody has any outstanding questions, please do feel free to submit them in the questions pane and we'll get to them. Uh, just for a moment here, can you give us any comments on the differences between Unity and Unreal? Sure. Do you want to take this or do you, do you want me to have it? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I've been doing a lot of time, uh, putting a lot of time into Unreal uh, lately just to just get a different feel for it because I'm way more of, I have way more experience with it as a Unity developer. I've published 18 games <laughs> through Unity and uh, taught it for a while. But um, Unreal and Unity, the biggest misconception is that Unreal is better graphically, right? Um, you can get just as good of graphics out of Unity um, for the most part, unless we're talking about bleeding edge type stuff, uh, you just have to massage it a bit. Unreal comes with all of those bells and whistles turned on in the default project, like screen motion blur is like the biggest thing. And everyone goes, oh, it's got motion blur, it's so fancy. Um, there's a little post-process thing you can add into Unity to get the same thing. Um, but they're, they're becoming kind of like uh, the singularity where they're, they're both getting very, very close to being the same thing, where some people are developing a visual scripting uh, plug in for Unity and people are developing a way to code C Sharp for Unreal. Um, but I would say the default version of it, that the biggest difference is um, the fact that we have obviously the Blueprint script in Unreal and then uh, C Sharp in, in Unity. So that would mean, you know, the back end of Unreal is C++. So you have to manage your own memory, where in C Sharp you can be a little bit sloppier about that and run garbage collection where it does it itself. Uh, that, that's more back. I'm trying to think as far as what the user would see, what would be the difference. Um, in my experience, 2D games are much uh, easier and simpler to pull off in, in, in or 2D project games. Uh, uh, 2D projects in Unity as opposed to in, in Unreal. A lot of people I know who have tried to do 2D, they end up getting frustrated with it. it it's predominantly a 3D engine. Um, Hmm. I would say There's, the biggest there are some difference. Nice, nice features in Unreal for sure. Yeah, I would say the biggest difference just off the bat is C sharp and C plus um, plus, mm -hmm. and it, well, even even the the extra tools like for example they have um, level of detail like auto LOD creating tools inside of Unreal which are pretty awesome. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones like their their tech, their uh, particle effects generators like all those extra tools are, are really really nice compared to what Unity has where you have to get a third party plugin or typically Unity buys up some company once people they realize a lot of people are using it but it never feels as well integrated as like DataSmith does in in Unreal. Excellent, excellent. I think we got to our last question here. What other features do you have planned for the remainder of Mark Three, and when do you estimate they'll be deployed? So we're uh, so our biggest thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, our biggest one is to have the networking working, mm -hmm. uh, where two different uh, PCs can see each other um, on the network. Maybe we have a code, or there's actually rooms you can see on a, a public li publicly listed list uh, with a password of some kind, and then they can go in uh, to the same project, see each other. Uh, they can send files back and forth between the computers. Uh, files being images yeah. and uh, leaving sessions. Uh, on the server so like you can come back to your session and all the markup will still be there did i miss anything guys uh no okay excellent guys uh we've gotten to the tail end of our questions uh we really appreciate all the helpful information if anybody has any further questions or would like to reach out to us 
um, please feel free. I think uh, since we've reached the end of our questions, we're going to go and close up the webinar. But once again, uh, feel free to reach out to us with any questions or concerns. Thank you again, Karis and Brian, for your time. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you, guys.